we're going to break the session into two halves. In the first half, we've got three speakers to, to begin exploring this theme. And I'm really delighted to welcome Ruth, Ruth Gill, who's Director of Public Programmes at the National Museums of Scotland. Samiksha Jha, who is Programme Officer at the Martha Farrell Foundation <coughs> in India. And Paul Goff, who's Vice Chancellor at the University of the Arts in Bournemouth. And, and Ruth and Samiksha and Paul are each going to share a story of their experience of leadership during the last 12 months. <coughs> so without further ado, uh, I think Jamie's going to bring up the campfire to get us in the mood. And Ruth, uh, we're going to pass over to you uh, to tell us your story. Thank you. Um, could I have my slides? Lovely, thank you. Because this is the setting for where my story starts. This is a very handsome Victorian atrium at which stands at the heart of the National Museum of Scotland where I work. And soon after the first lockdown, I was standing here talking to a colleague, uh, sharing lockdown experiences. And he asked me what role I'd played um, in the opening and closing of our various museums. And when I told him, he said, wow, that's great, Ruth. How did you know how to do that? And, and the question took me back and I smiled and laughed and said, I don't know, I think I just made it up. But I was reflecting on this on the train heading home that evening because I hadn't made it up, but where had it come from? And by the time I had got home, I had concluded it came from here on the next slide. So I'm third out of four children. I'm there on the right, uh, the one without the Microsoft, Microsoft shape blurring my face. Um, and four is the perfect number for a pop-up anytime, anywhere board game. Every day, all day, if it was raining, we'd play board games. And in those hours of playing, I think I was learning lots of things that I would draw on in these last 18 months. On the next slide is an example. So here's Buckaroo. Uh, I was hugely aware during this time of people's changing abilities to take on workload. Uh, with 80% of my team furloughed and an enormous amount of work to be done, I had to control my temptation to overload people uh, and to pace set, but instead to listen, uh, slow down, read the cues and ask the right questions. Often the right questions weren't even about work. The next slide shows downfall. Uh, I don't think I've ever been so aware of needing to progress multiple things in a single moment or action whilst the clock is ticking. I feel that every time I went downstairs to boil the kettle for tea, I would be doing five other things whilst, whilst that was boiling. On the next slide, beat the black ball. Now, a lesser known game here, but absolutely my favorite. And this game is all about competitive timing. Going fast doesn't give you the point, but achieving your objective does. And through this game, I learned that holding back is sometimes as important as making a move. And waiting for others is key. You know, you don't have to be first or even second all the time, but you do want to get closest to that prize. And then on the last slide, risk, of course. It's been an absolutely unprecedented time for creating so many different ways to analyze risk. And yet it has felt like such a whimsical time too, where judgment and luck were at play together constantly and exhaustingly. Strategy seemed to go to pot on the roll of a dice. So, so these were some of the things I was thinking about when I was traveling home that day on that nearly empty train, on it very unexpectedly reflecting back on my first decade to thoughts about playing for fun, uh, but rehearsing for life and about the importance of family and group dynamics and getting along and about how to do well, sometimes even win, but not cause arguments. Wonderful, thank you. I'm going to pass over seamlessly to Simiksha, who's going to share her story with us. So hello, everyone. I think you all can see the screen. And I wanted to share this picture with you all uh, so that you all can resonate with what I'm going to talk today. So I'm going to share my learning of leadership from the work I have been associated during the pandemic. 
the last 18 months has been very difficult for everyone. And when we talk about informal workers in India, they were at the margins. They were struggling with several challenges, including lack of space for physical distancing, loss of jobs and income, increasing risk of violence in their homes, and many more. And through a participatory exchange of information and experience from women domestic workers, we found that these challenges were extracting a heavy toll on domestic workers' mental and physical health. And as a response to that, Priya and Martha Farrell Foundation initiated a COVID-19 relief kit drive for women domestic workers in consultation with and by women domestic workers. So I want to tell this that this drive was very unique because it used participatory method and was led by women domestic workers in their communities. So we were at our homes with our laptop open and were communicating either through calls or Zoom. But these women were helping each other through thick and thin in their communities. I recall the day when I called Sarita Didi, a domestic worker champion in Gurgaon, and asked, how are we going to distribute the kits to ones who need it immediately? And I was panicking at the moment because I was not sure how to handle it from work from home situation. But Sarita Didi assured me and said, you just send us the kits and we will organize the distribution. She said that with too much of confidence and belief, I learned my first le uh, lesson of leadership from her, which is calmness with belief. Hope and the will to keep going also emerged in the strength that domestic workers displayed. I spoke to a woman who was pregnant and living alone with her children. Her husband had left them. When I asked her what she plans to do, she said she would stay, work and educate her children. And again, I learned another lesson of leadership from her that we got bothered by the smallest problem and here was a woman willing to do everything to tackle something so big and challenging. And I would say another learning uh, during this time was about how important it is to build trust. And I believe the foundation of any leadership lies in the trust we have with the people and here I'm talking about the mutual trust. So I have interacted with more than 1,000 women domestic workers in the span of 18 months. And every time I learn something new. And also I think the idea of leadership is somehow flawed because when you Google what is leadership, the Google will show leadership is a state of being in charge. But what I have learned from these women domestic workers that leadership is about resilience, about solidarity, about holding hands. World needs to know, we need to know in fact, the leader is not the one who leads or direct, and which is very true, that leader is someone who is next to you. Quality of leadership is in everyone. It is performed on daily basis by everyone. We just don't recognize it. The women with whom I work, may not have heard of this term leadership, but I firmly believe they are leaders in everyday life because the intent to help, willingness to come together for a cause, selflessness in doing anything and a sense of beliefs define them. So this picture was all about them and I learned a lot from them during the past 18 months. I want to end my presentation here and look forward to interacting with you all later. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sadiksha. That's um, that's very very powerful, and I'd love now to pass on to Paul Paul Goff uh, from Arts University in Bournemouth. Thank you very much, Paul, and great to see you all, colleagues, and delighted to be here. Um, and I was going to really reflect on what presented itself 18 months ago as what you know a transactional crisis, economic switch off, border meltdown, a disruptive chaos, but really also in the middle of it all, a kind of transformational opportunity from the point of view I took as leading an organization. I think I learned a great deal very early on about the power of we think, the power of the collective, of stakeholder engagement in building the strategy. In the middle of, I'd already started 45 days into the job in, in creating this new strategy for the university. And we did it in a very particular kind of way, very new for this university, which was a values-driven strategy, and I used a, a tool by Brené Brown around leadership through vulnerability 
to try and generate some ideas using as much stakeholder engagement as possible. In the middle, or at the very start of the pandemic, I felt we had to maintain the momentum. And I tried to tap into the strong sense of belonging that this university has, belonging to each other, belonging to the discipline. And I'd just come from a job six years in Australia and knew this, the power of the sense of belonging in terms of the work we did in our reconciliation plan and our relationship to, to earth, to the past. So belonging is a very powerful kind of way of gathering folk together. And we rebuilt the strategy. It was kind of hyperactive at one level in the middle of coping with the onset of, of the pandemic. I remember putting together a workshop of all technical staff around values, uh, trying to get a shared ownership of the future, working both with the grain of the organization, but also a, a sense of appreciative inquiry and, and a strengths-based approach. It was, it was unusual, but I sensed that it was one way of facing into the kind of transactional crisis that people could see around them. And then 45 days in, as I said, lockdown and I tried to change the language the language of lockdown is is when you have a you know a, someone with a gun on a campus or whether you're in a prison and and I reflecting now and we kept a kind of a learning log we did a, a program called doing it differently that gave us the opportunity to strip out stuff that was irrelevant we made lots of basic mistakes and we'd fess up every Thursday morning at my kind of cobra meeting saying why didn't we why didn't I get that right how is it that I still can't manage the disappointment of the students and the parents who are looking constantly for kind of adult advice? Where's the adult in the room? It threw back a kind of pressure on the individual, focus on individual action, which could threaten that lack of a cohesive togetherness. And I sensed as the so-called leader of the organization, you had to be there values driven, but trying to keep the framework together. And the local actions by my colleagues went way beyond duty, you know, delivering food to students, delivering desks, delivering computers, you name it, right around the region. It was very powerful to watch that. What was interesting, I'd done black swan scenario planning before, uh, you know, on a whole range of, of crises, but nothing really presented around this constant fluid, this morphing crisis. And there was a kind of an element at the moment, you'll all remember it, where you felt that who was in control? When you realize no one is in control, then actually what it proves is that everyone is in control. And that was really very powerful. It tested three things in the leadership for me. Our internal communications to each other was extraordinarily fragmented. It should have been easier, but it got more and more difficult, remedied by over communicating. It tested the bond between the board and the executive. And I had to say to my board, and they said, what do you want? And I'd say, I want your backing, and then I want you to back off. You've got to give me as much room to maneuver in a very fluid situation. But it also tested the ability, me included, more so than anyone, to listen, to empathize, react in a timely and thoughtful way, as others have been saying, even when I got a chance to talk to the minister. But above all, relying on values, it made me feel that leadership is really about closer to being not a chess master or anything strategic. It's about being a gardener, creating the conditions where others can grow in an ecosystem. I love the gardening analogy. For me, it really works in terms of what future and current leadership is and what I learned from this dreadful last 18 months, which have proved to be transformational on many levels. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you to all three of our speakers. and. We, we just wanted to give everyone just just a bit of a break now just to reflect on what you've heard such powerful powerful accounts and please just take this opportunity for a couple of minutes to reflect you know what resonated with you and already people are, are sharing thoughts in chat you know, what what were you curious to find out more about because we will have some questions later so if you want to formulate some questions how has it made you think about your own leadership and and what connections did you did you hear between our three our three speakers so as i say a couple of minutes to just settle around the fire and to and to just connect Okay, so I hope you're enjoying sitting around our campfire and uh, thinking about your own stories of leadership during the last 18 months and also reflecting on the um, compelling accounts we've heard from our other storytellers. 
and do take the opportunity to pop questions or other comments into the chat. But it's um, down to me to introduce our next three speakers. And uh, we're really delighted to be joined by um, two of them live. And one of them is uh, going to be sharing their presentation by a film, a pre-recorded film, as they were unable and um, unexpectedly to join us today. So our first speaker is Maggie Dorman, Associate Provost for Academic Partnerships at Imperial College. Um, next up is Dominic Galliano, who's Head of Public Engagement at UCL, and I discovered um, at the networking session earlier, has been to around seven engaged conferences, I think you said, Dom, so someone who's been around these agendas for a while, has got some, he's going to be sharing some of his stories, and Esme Ward, who's Director of the Manchester Museum and Professor of Heritage Futures, who's going to be our third and final storyteller. So without more ado, I'm going to hang over to um, Maggie um, and and we'll play her pre-recorded story. Imperial has a new campus in West London, in White City, um, in an area where it's actually difficult to reach many families, where there are really large health and educational inequities, and over 35% of families still live in relative poverty. And I find that a shocking statistic, actually, in a city like London in the 21st century. And, and none of this has been helped, of course, by the pandemic. These are the families that are affected most by the pandemic. We are fortunate to have a wonderful engagement space, the Invention Rooms, where we can welcome and collaborate with our neighbours of all ages. There's a specialised maker space, which is effectively a sophisticated workshop where young people can come and turn their ideas into reality. There's also a community space where we can lay on networking sessions for women in the community. We can deliver Saturday science for families with young children, um, science-based learning sessions for local youth clubs and much, much more. During the pandemic, the space has had to close, but we were determined to continue to work with our neighbors and support them both with practical solutions, for instance, to ensure that they had access to the digital world with sufficient data capacity to be meaningful, um, as well as with inspirational science opportunities. The family assist team in the local borough helped us to find the most vulnerable families in our area, who we then worked with to create our, our new and actually rapidly becoming infamous science packs, which contain all the materials needed for a series of home-based experiments and activities. We've done something similar with our makerspace, designing fabulous kits for our local schools so that they can carry on making, even though they can't be at the invention rooms. And as you can see, the kit contains, again, everything that they need for the making exercises, from glue to pliers to electric circuit boards and, and so on. Through these science and making kits, and in many other ways, we've maintained our contact with the community. We've maintained the all important trust. And as we are starting to open up the excitement of being with our scientists again. Yet despite all of this incredible work, I am constantly concerned about the fragility of the team, the specialists who drive excellence in engagement and enable our academic staff to be the best that they can be. And in a university like Imperial, where education, research and innovation are the raison d'etre, there's a constant need to reinforce the message that these professionals are an invaluable but vulnerable part of our community. Sustainability of our team here at Imperial is actually one of the things that keeps me awake at night. It, the engagement is not at the top um, of the priority list, or sometimes it feels like that. Um, and so I think just being resilient and persistent and keep telling people about the importance of what we do and illustrating that importance through examples of what we've been doing, I think it's been really important. So more than ever, just giving that team of professionals a seat at the table, if you like, a voice at the table at the top of the college. Great, thank you, Maggie. And uh, without more ado, I'm gonna pass over to Dominic Galliano um, to tell his story. Dominic. 
Thanks so much, Sophie. Thanks for having me. Um, today, I wanted to talk about the lesson I had to relearn last year. At the end of 2020, I was exhausted. Like, I was really tired. Um, I was in a really low place. Um, I was working in the high, well, working higher education, a sector which I feel was calling us bureaucrats and was championing dispassionate, uh, dispassionate uh, behavior in kind of its senior researchers. And it really felt like it was a place where I wasn't going to feel valued. And I felt that a really low place, a place with really low self confidence. Um, so I took some time off work. I had to take some time off work to kind of work on my mental health. And um, I kind of realized that kind of what I felt was a weakness was actually my strength. That importance about being a human, that importance about being open, being kind, being empathetic, that, that was actually well, the reason why we're here, the reason why we are engagement professionals and the reason why we are hired to do what we do. So it was important to kind of relearn these lessons for myself, for my team, and then for the sector. For myself, I had to remind myself that it was okay to say no, especially at a time where we were going through a second year of a pandemic. And UCL on top of that is still restructuring and was going through a restructure at the time. So there was no public engagement awards for the first time in 12 years at UCL. And I had to let myself know that that was okay. Our networking kind of programs stopped because instead there were more immediate actions we could take with our uh, training and our funding rounds instead that would have greater impact in our kind of outside community. So it was important to allow myself to actually say no. Give ourselves time to reflect and reprioritize based on what was going on and reflect on kind of all the new innovations that we put in as a result of responding to everything as well. So I led, I did this myself and then I managed to kind of get my team on top on board with this as well. And it led to some really fantastic examples. So I'm gonna be name dropping here. Ben kind of run this amazing training program across all of UCL that involved 22 delivery partners from both inside and outside the university and it was all online. But normally, with the energy of 2020 that we had as well, we would have just moved on to something else. But instead, we took the time to actually stop and give them the space to reflect and learn from that properly. And now our funders in HR within the university are our strongest partners ever because they were really excited to see what it was that Ben managed to kind of put together from our learning. And it was as a result of just having that time. Helen had been really curious about doing patient and public involvement for the last couple of years. And an opportunity came up at UCL Partners with the section of the university that deal with NHS partners. And it meant that kind of I was going to be another person down. It was really one person down. And it would be a whole bunch more greater logistics to do another succumbent to fill in. But we gave her the opportunity to do this. And that led to, bear, uh, to Helen sharing her experiences with UCL Partners and developing training for patients who kind of get involved with PPI often. And I'm really excited to see what that's going to kind of evolve into. And not only that, but UCL partners actually now are hiring a permanent person into the post uh, who's here in the audience. And I'm really excited for them starting in the next couple of weeks. So it's really great to see all these positive outcomes as a result of allowing us that space to be human as a team and to kind of give ourselves the space to reflect and reprioritize. Now, the last bit is the challenging bit. How do we get these messages across to our sector, especially kind of the senior leadership? which is sadly kind of embroiled in a way of working, which is a really, really horrible combination of the old patriarchy, imposter syndrome, and toxic behaviors. Um, our kind of ways of working are very much opposite these. Yet these are ways of working that we bring every day in when we kind of deal with external partners. So I think it's about time we showcase these and bring these right to the front whenever we work with a senior management at university or kind of anyone within the sector. It really is time that we kind of make being human very much a strength and not a weakness, especially at a time when our colleagues are striking around these very behaviors that we're trying to change. So remember all, it's a strength, it's not a weakness. So thank you. Well, thanks, Tom. Thanks for your honesty. And um, yeah, brilliant. And um, well, I'm sure we'll be picking up on a lot of the themes that are coming out from all of our speakers um, shortly. But we have one more storyteller, one more person who's going to be sharing her story with us. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Esme Ward. Esme, over to you. Thanks so much. Um, uh, and how wonderful to hear all these stories and perspectives. Um, so I'd actually like to go back uh, to a key moment just after lockdown was announced. Um, we'd closed the museum and I'm sat uh, at my dining room table at home, uh, staring out the window. Uh, and what I remember more than anything else is feeling nauseous, um, like a kind of, like motion sickness, no solid ground beneath my feet. Um, 
I'd spoken to the team at the museum. I'd asked them all to take some time, uh, at least a week, to really try and adapt, make room in their homes, for work, sort out the kids, do whatever was needed, to be frank. Um, I myself have been running pretty hard and fast to ensure that our vivarium team, we have live animals at the museum, um, to make sure they had 24 hour access during lockdown to keep the animals alive um, and, and that they were happy to continue in their work. But finally, sat at home, uh, my sense was actually, I and we really needed to try and find some solid ground. Um, and I knew it wasn't going to be found in bricks and mortar. We were a mid capital project at the museum uh, and building work was showing little sign of slowing down. Uh, our new two floor extension was growing each day, um, uh, building for some kind of imagined and increasingly distant future. And so I sense that the solid ground that I and we were seeking lay in the values of the organisation and my colleagues, and that those really needed to guide us through whatever lay ahead. We've been already doing a lot of work together, exploring what an ethics of care uh, and a commitment to care might look like in a museum. When you extend your care beyond collections to people, ideas, beliefs and relationships, and we decided together that it would frame our work and decision-making throughout the pandemic and beyond. For me, actually, one of the hardest parts of shutting the museum was closing Project Inc, um, a space for an edu educational charity based with us, a college for neurodiverse young people at the heart of our museum. Um, we had no alternative and we did our best to support them uh, and countless other groups with creative care kits, online resources, anything, anything we could do really. But we knew we needed to do more, so we actually also made sure we registered as a specialist college. So if another lockdown happened, we would this time be able to stay open. And of course, this is what happened. So in our case, in lockdowns two and three, while we did indeed remain closed to the public, we were able to stay open for 12 young people day in, day out. And it was important in so many ways, of course, for those young people and their parents and teachers, but also for museum staff who support them and our institutional sense of purpose. Around the same time in those early summer months last year, I and several colleagues reached out to people across the city, environmental activists in particular, organizations and charities, to ask how we could help to take the time to listen and to hear what they really needed. How could we do things differently moving forwards and how could we do them together? Rethink collectively how we care and take action to build understanding, empathy and love for our world and each other. And it's led us to rethinking the entire top floor of the museum where Project Inc are based. It's becoming a co-working hub for environmental and educational charities that share our mission to build a more sustainable world. It's attracted new funding, shared posts with the Carbon Literacy Project, new relationships. Um, we were probably never more open than when we were closed. It's changed our work, the sense of collective endeavor at the museum and reaffirmed our commitment to our civic and social role. It's foundational. And actually, it's that solid ground we were looking for. Thank you. Great, thank you, um, Esme. And uh, that concludes our, our six storytellers. And we've heard a lot of diverse stories about leadership um, over the last 18 months. Um, we've had some really honest reflections on what that's been like. We've been inspired by the models of leadership people have drawn on. And um, I'm going to give you just a couple of minutes, uh, two minutes, to reflect around the fire once again. And in your reflections, you might want to be saying, well, what are your stories? What are, what are you drawing on in your leadership? And what have you learned about yourself and your leadership and the leadership of those around you? And you might want to say, well, actually, I'm really curious. I'd like to ask a question. Or I'd like to put a discussion point out to our um, storytellers. So use this opportunity to do one or both of those things. And we'll come back in two minutes.
Great, thank you. So let's all come back together and I think we're going to share all of our panel. I think we're all going to gather around the, the fire now so that we can see you all. And um, I'm going to kick us off with a question that was really prompted by Dom's, um, Dom's comments about, you know, uh, being human, being a strength, bringing that human centeredness and actually how that sits within our current cultures of higher education. And um, I just like you to reflect on how have you brought that human centered approach to your work? Um, and I'm going to start. Um, I don't know where I'm going to start. Does somebody want to start or shall I just pick one of you to start? Everyone's not looking at me, so I'm going to pick Paul. You're you're you're, you're currently leading one of these organisations. What? How how do you bring a a, a human centred leadership to that role? I think some of the uh, recognition we've had here. Uh, I think there's a tremendous one there that the team were never together as much as when we all felt we are pushed apart. I think uh, I still think that universities were. A, are human, they're, they're people centered business. And, um, and what it brought, the best it brought out in me and others is uh, remaining as focused on supporting this sort of atomized student population and those who surrounded and wanted to work with them and loved them. And we needed to make sure that they felt as connected as possible. Uh, it didn't always work. Uh, I felt that times we were flailing around. Personally, I felt that. I, you know, one would make an intervention that was appropriate with one group of people, but not with others. And I think one had to fess up to that. And I think having the courage with my leadership team to say, you know what, we got that completely wrong, completely wrong. Let's, how do we fail fast and, and make sure we recover quickly? And I think working closely with my students' union and recognizing what they were saying was a kind of raw truth that was often very uncomfortable, doing staff surveys, doing student surveys, uncomfortable messages being sent back, but also having to kind of face up to, to groups of staff and students and parents saying there aren't any simple answers to this. I cannot give you a, a, a one-off answer. It's much more contingent than that. And so almost recognizing one's own vulnerability and saying, you know, not just I'm doing my best and they say, we well, expect that of you because you get paid enough and you're given the kind of authority, but also where are the best ideas, solutions, suggestions in the room? in the Zoom and reaching out to make sure that you can crowdsource some sort of solution. That's, that's, that's how I played it. In fact, that's how I play my entire leadership, really, because I always recognize, you know, the heroes on horseback is a long, long, long way away. This is much more about a much more democratic environment. It goes back to the gardening analogy. You create the conditions where others can flourish. That's, that's how it works for me. Great, thanks, Paul. I'm looking across the rest of the panel. Um, I don't know if you'd like to go next, Samiksha. You, you, you seem to bring human centeredness to your models of leadership and work. Would you like to reflect on how you bring that human centeredness into that into your work in that way? Yeah, human centeredness. Yeah, of course. So, uh, whatever the work we do with the women domestic workers or the adolescents, mostly we work with. So uh, we never say we never in our work it never get reflected that it's a one way thing. We always believe in the local knowledge thing that the person's local knowledge, uh, the knowledge they have about their situation surrounding is the utmost, and we cannot like lead them. So uh, this uh, I think you all must know that this is the method of uh, whenever we are doing any kind of participatory method. So. Uh, making anything humanistic or working with the community at uh, ground level, at humanistic level, it is very important that we don't put what we are thinking. Instead, we see what they are feeling, what they are reflecting. So this is also one kind of leadership also. Like we are not just imposing ourselves. In fact, we are talking, sharing, just like we are doing today. So I think this adds to the human-centric approach in our work. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Samishka. Anybody else in the panel want to take um, a reflect on that question before I move on? Do you want to wave at me if you'd like to? Oh, oh brilliant. Thanks, Ruth. Hi. Um, I... Um... I think we've all said in very, very different ways um, a, a very similar thing, which is that the 
uh, traditional, uh, traditionally held um, metaphors and values around leadership are still persistent, but very unhelpful. <laughs> And um, I and, and we're saying that actually we are each leaders in different ways um, and, and, and pull on different things in different situations. You know, it, we've, we've been talking about it being relational and situational uh, and not hierarchical and, and all the things uh, that, that go with those traditional models of, you know, why, why does warfare keep coming up in those metaphors? It's just ridiculous, isn't it? You know, here we are in public engagement, working with leadership metaphors about uh, warfare and being Machiavellian <laughs> and stridently confident and never doubting and all of these crazy things that have absolutely nothing to do at all with public engagement. Um, so so I, I, I think, though, to, to, to try to get closer to your question, I, I, I think that for me, you know, if you believe that about leadership, that it's not about what only certain people do and do in certain ways, that it's about all of us in all ways um, and leading in so many different ways, then actually it's about flexibility. And, and whilst we're, I'm sure we all have preferences and personalities and you can take all those tests and all the rest of it, and they show us you know, our, our preferences for things, but they don't show us where we stop and start as people. And, and, and I really think that leadership is about that flexibility and to the best of your endeavors, trying to work out what, what, what is the thing I'm actually trying to lead right now? You know, what needs leading? <laughs> and I'm my other person to be doing it. And then what style of leadership does that need? And sometimes, you know, it is a sort of a big burst of energy and, and pace. And it's about involving people and experimenting and uh, change. It's all those things. And it's, you know, failing quickly, as Paul was saying earlier. But sometimes it is not that. And that would be really annoying. And, it, and it's, um, you know, say if it's a big kind of set capital project style of thing, then it's actually about taking people through a complicated set of frameworks and rules that already exist. Uh, and it's about controlling change, not throwing it all up in the air. So it, I think it's different things. And, and, and that's, I think that's how I try to bring a human centered approach is to try and think what leadership is required, perhaps more than what leadership, what leadership should I should I be? You know, what, what type of leader am I? Is that actually what's required in this situation? And do your best to be that. Great. Thanks, Ruth. And um, I'm just, oh, oh, sorry. Of course, John, you go ahead. Hey, can I, just say, and I wanted to add a point, actually, that um, Sarah and Dawn kind of mentioned in the chat. And that is the importance that um, by being human and bringing that humanity to your work and your leadership style, it doesn't mean kind of giving it your everything like more important now than ever it's important to realize to keep your energy for things outside work outside your laptop you know and kind of other things that you feel are important in your life whatever that may be you know because I think that's more important than ever is that's the stuff that recharges you now so it's not being human to be it's kind of like bringing everything and all your energy into kind of that like sort of that role no you got to remember about all the other things that you do you know, and for me, it's kind of dancing around to kind of Kylie or something in the evenings, whatever it is that it is that kind of brings you that joy and you do other things, remember that more so than ever, you know, and when you're a leader, remember to kind of mention that and kind of, you know, to anyone else that you're leading with that you are having that time away from it or else you're just going to end up being burnt out. So. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Dom. And I, I wonder if other panelists want to reflect on that. There was a, a few reflections, as Dom said, in the chat about um, it sounds when you were telling your stories, you seem to have brought all of yourself to this. And actually, um, that, as Dom says, you know, that can be quite um, exhausting and it doesn't feed the other part. So how do you draw your boundaries, you know, when you're leading? What, you know, how do you manage that? Because it's quite a subtle dance I think managing that your own well-being your own kind of like and and then be leading and I, I wonder do you want to wave if you'd like to reflect on that so I'm not just picking yeah. people oh brilliant Esme I'd love to there hear you from go. you great um great well um so first of all I'm just going to pick up on the human centered um a uh, bit partly because what's the alternative I mean, seriously, you know, <laughs> and I know we all know what the alternative is, but, but actually, you know, if, if, 
if we do what we've always done, then we get what we've always got. And 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 I don't know about anyone else, but that's not where we're heading. So um, just in relation to the question I actually said I'd answer, um, which was around the, this whole self. Um, I don't know, is my honest answer. Um, I really grapple with this, uh, and most people I know really grapple with this. Um, when um, you're, you know, I, I work in, 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 in a university context, but in museums, they're about the complexity of the human experience. It's pretty hard to disentangle um, your, yourself from that. Um, but actually, I think you talk to others and actually I learn from others. So I really love that Dom was talking about all the different people he worked with and the work they were leading. You know, for me, so much of what I learn, I learn from colleagues and partners. And we've, we've had whole staff sessions where we've talked about exactly this issue and the different things colleagues of mine do. Everything from the yoga sessions, the God, the endless dogs, let's face it. Um, the 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 walks, the the rituals, you know, I'm in a museum, we love rituals. You know, we've had long conversations about are there things we could explore together that help this and individually. And you know, in a way, I'm kind of comfortable with not really knowing how to answer that question because I wonder whether more and more my role is to ask those questions and and you know as Paul says I'm a gardener so that made me really happy but creating those conditions where you convene and bring those people together to explore those questions and that collective learning you may not get to the resolution but you know maybe that's fine mm. Mm. thanks thanks Esme anybody else want to comment on that Paul, I saw you nodding away and you, Samishka. But Ruth, you've, you put your hand up, so I'll come to you. <laughs> uh, just, just very quickly, uh, I think, I, 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 I don't like whole self phrases. Um, I, I, it just always makes me feel like I, I've, you know, been partial before I've even started, you know, sort of already, already lost something um, and not been good enough. And, and gosh, I think we're all, you know, our own worst critic anyway. We certainly don't need that. Uh, for me, it's whole self immediately makes me think I should be working more hours than I do or weekends and, you know, be up in the middle of the night, you know, thinking through all the problems. I, I, I just don't think that's good for any of us, actually. Uh, for me, uh, what I take from whole self is uh, a sense of uh, authenticity and truthfulness, uh, if that's not too hammy. I, I don't mean the hammy version of that. I mean the really good version of that. You know, just dealing with people, uh, you know, transparently, truthfully, as if in a way that you would want to be treated. You know, these sorts of values. I think that's what whole self is about. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. And in a minute, I'm just going to ask, there might be somebody in our um, webinar participants who want to say something. So if you want to say anything, I understand I can allow you to talk, which sounds a bit too draconian to me, but um, just pop your hand up. And in the meantime, I'm going to pick up the question by Carlo in the Q&A. It says, I would just like to know if you have any advice or top tips for someone who is just beginning in a leadership role and is feeling the imposter syndrome as they've not done it before. Any top tips? I'm going to give you just a chance to think about that. I'm hoping that, um, yeah, Shamishka, I feel like you might have something to say about that. Could I come to you first? Would that be all right? Yeah. Uh, actually, I was also seeing this question. So I'm also uh, not very old to this leadership role, like two, two and a half years I have been. So what I have learned uh, during this journey is that yeah, sometimes we feel like, no, we are not doing much. Uh, are we not capable of this? But just we have to remind ourselves, no, uh, we learn, we grow, we grow as we learn. Everything is a learning process and learning requires unlearning also, relearning also. If we keep this in mind, so then maybe this thought can will not surround us and maybe we will not doubt ourselves maybe. 
<laughs> thank you. Um, Paul, do you want to speak? Yeah, thank you very much, Sophie. There's so much great material here. I'm copying it all down, thinking I've got to, I've got to revisit some of this. I've got to use some of this in my next talk to start about what leadership could be, how you're all <laughs> leaders. It's really good. I guess, you know, for me, humility, authenticity, uh, is so powerful. Uh, a lot of the colleagues I speak to at my level will say, you're only as good as your next five minutes, really, in these roles. It's a bit like, a bit like a football manager. You're as good as your most recent results. So the pressure comes from you in all, all angles and you have to ride over it. Now, I keep pushing back at, at colleagues and saying, when you're starting a leadership position, it's a bit like being a gardener. I'm told that you have to watch the garden for a year. And I just wonder whether we give ourselves enough time just to kind of hop, before you make the decisions and the decisions were upon us on an hourly basis. I was having to make minute by minute decisions most, you know, I've got 50-50, I've got a tossed a coin at the end of the day, but to be able to have the time, if you can find it, to watch the garden, just see what's happening, get the rhythm of the business, especially if you move into a new museum or, or to part of an industry or, or a university, is just watch and listen and, and stay attuned to the granularity. It may sound a bit sort of, uh, a bit too kind of prosaic, but that's that's what I think we need now and the best are providing. Uh, I'm certainly not one of the best, but I certainly feel that when I hear people and, and in this room now speaking with such such sensitivity uh, and sensitiveness, it's really very powerful, actually. So thank you very much. But it's watch the garden for a year if you can, if you have the time. The trouble is we haven't that much time, especially in the climate crisis we're in at the moment. The garden may not survive. Thank you, Tom. A quite a practical one I found when I, I, I started. Um, so it's really odd because I've, I've been in leadership roles for a while, but I kind of practically started managing people like about three years ago, I think was when I started in those sort of roles. And for me, my bigger challenge was uh, my imposter syndrome stuff came through in the bits that I didn't know about, the things that were new to me. And I think what helped was actually identifying that and being really clear about that. So for me, it was learning all those HR processes. You know, I could do the mentoring thing. I could do the kind of giving my team the space that they needed to grow and develop and stuff. But what I didn't have was kind of all the process, kind of all the stuff that comes through and it's different in every organization that you work for. You know, so kind of identify what it is that kind of is actually causing you to feel like an imposter and try, if you're a very logical thinker, I tend to map it out, you know, sort of, you know, physicist by training and then kind of, you know, act on it. You know, the, the biggest thing I find is if I don't act on it, I then kind of, of like oh no I don't know I don't know I don't know and just by doing one act and whether that's like you know reading the absence leave policy you know or kind of like doing that together with your team and stuff that's kind of the thing that the sort of way I kind of found out I could edge my way out of that imposter syndrome kind of whirlwind that I was in it's just you know identify what it is that you actually need to get on and just just act in it whether it's the smallest action that day just kind of do that and that's kind of a way I found kind of to get myself out of it brilliant thanks Tom um did, are that, you waving as me? Yeah, of course. Yeah, could I just on on the back of what Dom's just said? Actually, I suppose these are really obvious, but um, I'm I'm wondering. I mean, I I never run a museum, been director of a museum, and I inherited a very very ambitious, quite complex capital project. Um, so the imposter syndrome feeling was quite real, um, uh, and actually um, uh, decided very early on that I really wanted a, a great mentor. Um, uh, which has been fantastic, but also the power of a network, actually. So building those relationships with peers who were um, also feeling, uh, particularly during the pandemic, actually, that as, as Ruth said, we were all, you know, we were making it up as we went along how to do this. And, and so really, I, I've got a slight obsession with who fellow travellers are. In, in, in terms of, of leadership and that that kind of um, the that that humility that Paul Paul mentioned is really critical for me. And so actually really identifying who your fellow travelers are and starting to really build those networks and invest the time and energy with them because actually they probably help support and challenge in a really good way some of my thinking and decisions across the piece. So. Great. Thanks, Esme. Now, I promised an option for our lovely um, participants to put up their hand and either share a quick question or reflection. Does anybody want to do that? Claudia, are you there? Oh, I'm on this other side now. Oh, hello. <laughs> Great. So what's your question or quick reflection, Claudia? Um, 
I mean, this is something that relates to what lots of people on the panel have said, uh, maybe more so with, with Dom, but, you know, we all reflected on authenticity in leadership and, and so on and so forth. And um, the fact about being your whole self, however we want to phrase it, you know, being just being you being you um, makes you approachable and real to so many people around you and especially in a time of extreme challenge i work in a role where i have the immense honor and privilege of uh, looking after a number of undergraduate students not because they because i hold a course but because i work in public engagement so i do outreach with them and and so on and so forth and in a week i had deep authentic conversations with three of them that were really not in a good place and I'm not clearly this is not an achievement right I'm not happy that they're struggling but I'm immensely honored and humbled by the fact that they would want to reach out to me and does this make me a great leader probably not but it makes me someone that they want to talk to and being trying to be that person and being humble with yourself and remind yourself what can I do today to make myself one step closer to break that barrier to break that power differential I think that is what we can like a positive lesson that I'm taking from this that it, you don't have to be ashamed that true leadership uh, the way that Samishka was saying is in the little actions that make us real, not in, you know, being in a super high paid, highly paid job or in, in a really important position or everyone reads your articles Great. or whatever. Thank you all for everything that you've shared. Great, thank you so much, Claudia. And thank you for being brave enough to put your hand up. I feel like I need to give you a cheer and a, and a, a round of applause just for that. Um, so we're, Coming to the end of this um, session, so I'm going to hand over to Paul, um, who I think's got one final reflection for the panel. Yes, gosh, I <clears throat> I had no idea what this session would be like, and I found myself absolutely moved by the content and by the experiences you've shared. So I just wanted to genuinely thank you for what has been just in intensely moving and important i think the things you've shared have really helped me and i i just wondered we we've kind of convened you around our virtual fire um and you haven't met each other before and we brought you together and i just wondered listening to each other uh what you'd sort of learnt and and picked up from each other and, and what for you has been a kind of light bulb moment in in the last hour i i wondered if anyone would be happy to to kick off if you wanted to put your hand up if you feel ready to to answer that. Ruth, thank you. Um, something for me uh, that I, in, in the moment of reflection that we had, I was really thinking about was the importance of leadership metaphors. Um, otherwise, it's all very vague, isn't it? And we're not quite sure what it is. And it's this sort of intangible between us all. And, and, I, and I, loved, I loved the gardening metaphor uh, that Paul, so that's where I particularly had the thought from. But, but maybe more important than the gardening, the specific metaphor was just the importance of a metaphor. Because as soon as he mentioned it, we could all imagine that leadership style and what that group was trying to do together and how. Um, and, and so just just by just by um, you know just through the power of of calling it something, it just became very tangible and real. And I, and I really thought that was important. And I'd like to think more about leadership metaphors and using them. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Yeah, just uh, reflecting on that. In fact, your your provocation to me, Paul and Sophie, the other day is, you know, at this level, VCs are often seen. You know, they, they like to call themselves everything from white knights, catalysts choreographers, bandmasters, you name it. There are lots out there. The worst one is conductor, you know, like Leonard Bernstein doing a terrific job at the front, keeping everyone in control. Well, we know 
90% of the uh, the musicians don't look at the conductor at all, which is fine, because they're still doing their Bruckner or whatever. So, um, yeah, I think the garden is interesting, but I think there's an element to it. My wife's a much better gardener than I'll ever be, because she will take a five-year view of that vast agapanthus that's there and, and make a decision based on the long term. And Ruth, what I thought was very interesting about what you said was, that um, many have said this, you have to morph your style as a head leader or whatever, according to the context and the, and the conditions you're faced with, that it can't be, you know, there's no one size. If anything, I've learned the last 18 months that <laughs> there's, there's more sizes than there are in a shoe shop. You know, there's not one size fits all anymore. And there's not one approach. And to have one approach might mean you're a monolithic kind of uh, leader, which who, 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 you know, achieves but I think we're in a very different morphing, fluid, mutating environment. Uh, and I think that's where the real test has been actually. And I think changing language, changing timing, changing space, changing the way you, you work haptically and into the world has been interesting just as much as someone mentioned in the chat. The students and the staff are in my living room now and I'm in theirs, we've lost the edges. And so to readjust to the blurred edge is a real challenge to having a big office, having authority and wearing a tie. You know, I think it's, it's a very interesting kind of moment that I think we've got to learn from here. And thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to hear such great ideas. Anyone else would like to like to chip in? Dom? Well, the two things. One was the commonality, kind of like around all uh, kind of what we were saying, and it's especially considering how different some of our circumstances are kind of to others and that actually brings me to my second point is, is Esme's reminder that kind of the importance of networks and talking about you know sort of uh, your leadership style kind of with others as well and that kind of actually reminded me how important like sort of talking to other heads of public engagement has been for me the kind mm -hmm. of last year and stuff you know and that's been really vital so that, that that importance is just being open and honest kind of with a group of your peers and stuff and you know thank you Esme for reminding me about the strength of that and all of you for sharing because it was really nice again here as a little group of you know being like okay it's really nice to hear those open stories from other leaders as well you know as well so yeah that's kind of our leaving it today thanks thank you Esme is your yeah yeah, um, so I, a couple of uh, things on my notepad I scribbled down. One was just um, our, our kind of collective attentiveness to language, actually. I, I think that real shift we're all making around the language we use. And actually, my, my page in front of me is just full of the world I want to live in because um, it's about belief and authenticity and humility and change and you know it, 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 there is a there is something actually I think deeply aspirational which um, has been part of this conversation and I just absolutely love Samiksha talked about calmness with belief which I think is a really beautiful I could kind of see it so uh, thank you that that's really stuck with me and and I suppose the other one that's aligned to that is this this real sense of how our collectively our values are driving that work and, and the way actually it's playing out in some quite practical decision making. Um, so just being able to reflect a bit more and, and in spite of all our different contexts, the way that that's played out. Um, yeah, food for thought, I need to think on, but thank you. It's me. And Samiksha, any thoughts from you? Yeah. So the last one year was one um, when I was very reflecting for me because, um, you know, the uh, talk, the conversation put emphasis on what I was thinking about leadership. So uh, as Paul uh, just mentioned that one shoes does not fit everybody as all the fingers are not same inside. So the idea of leadership is not same for everybody and it is not rigid. It is continuously evolving. The thing is that it is, it's not something which is history. It is continuously evolving. So I believe in this uh, model of leadership. And today when I interacted with uh, uh, these panelists and the participants, the idea become more stronger. Yeah, it did. Thank you. And just the very, very final task I'm going to set our wonderful panel is is just to leave us all with with an action something we could do to to take away from today a top tip maybe or something we might just practice that could help us because we all want to be better 
uh, at, at how we use our influence generously and carefully and wisely. So anything you might offer, and I might just go back in the order in which in which you all spoke, if that's okay. So Ruth, I'm going to come to you first. Just, just a quick top tip or an action, something we oh, can do. Um, gosh, I've got a rush of lots of things in my mind now. Um, the one that's close to the top is um, to, to be brave enough to ask someone that you've come across and you admire or have worked with for a long time and admire, um, ask them for a cup of tea. And it can be virtual or physical, but just a 10 minutes cup of tea and just pick their brains a little bit. And just hanging out with great people is fantastic. Wonderful, thank you. So make sure I'll come to you next. Yeah, so I think, yeah, I resonate with Ruth uh, so much. So I think uh, conversation is important, talking is important, listening is also equally important. When we listen, things uh, get better. So I think I'll take this back. Thank you. Paul? Yeah, I mean, uh, picking up the theme mentioned earlier on, Paul, was very much around keeping open, maintaining networks and looking outwards. When you're locked in your Zoom, in your room, I, I think the danger is that although you feel connected, your networks are, is, are so important and keeping looking outwards for the organization and feel as connected as possible at times when physically and haptically we've not been able to touch. And I think it's very important to keep of the world and in the world. Thank you, Dom. Just to be kind to yourselves and remember to, you know, give yourself a break and not an actual physical break, like going for a walk, but like a mental break. You can't do everything. You can't solve everything. And yeah, be kind to yourself with that. Just, you know, be realistic and have that cup of tea and just take that breather. So, or coffee or iced tea or whatever you drink. So, that's me. Um, uh, so mine, I, I'm going to sound a complete hippie here, but I'm going to go with it because I can't help myself. So um, uh, I do something which helps me enormously, which is I go every once a week, I go for a walk and I live in the Peak District. So I go to a rock, which appreciate not everyone has rocks on their doorstep. Um, but I do it because I go to a rock to look over my shoulder back at my organisation. And so um, uh, that's about trusting your gut and uh, taking or finding a way to create space to just look back over your shoulder at your organization and just get a sense of what's, what's bubbling up, how's it looking, how's it feeling? So I'd say maybe more heart, more feeling, less head. Thank you. Thank you all. I, I mean, I gosh, I wish we were in the same room together so that we could physically applaud. Uh, I know that we can virtually applaud, but that was just breathtaking and, and so rich. So thank you to all our panelists and to Maggie who, who couldn't join us today but was with us in spirit. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm.